So far this fall, we've been following the arc of the story of the Bible, from Noah to Abraham to Joseph. And last week, we were looking at one of the biggest events in biblical history, the kind of deliverance that comes along only once in a testament. Last week, we looked at the Old Testament equivalent of the New Testament resurrection story, the event that stated for the people of Israel once and for all the character of their God, a God who is mighty to save, who cares about the suffering of God's people, a God who acts on their behalf. And we're talking, of course, about the rescue that the people of Israel experienced when they left Egypt and found themselves trapped between the advancing Egyptian army in hot pursuit of their former slaves and the Red Sea, which blocked any hope of their escape. And on that terrifying night, God made a way for his people in a place where before there was only death and danger, right through the heart of the sea. And this event reverberates all throughout the rest of the Israelites' history. It's the thing that these people return to over and over and over again. And this morning we pick up the story not too long after that fateful event which shaped this former band of slaves into the people of God. At this point, they've spent a little bit of time wandering through the wilderness after crossing the Red Sea, and finally they have arrived at a place called Sinai. Now, up until now, our story has been quite busy. Abraham and Sarah were called to go, and they went, but they never really settled anywhere for very long. And when we join Joseph, his father Jacob and his brothers were settled into the land that God had promised Abraham, but they had to leave that land due to the famine. And the entire family ended up in Egypt. And of course, last week, we know that the, God delivered his people from Egypt as they ran away. So there's been a lot of action, a lot of movement. But now we are at the base of Sinai, and the pace of the story slows down quite a lot. In fact, the people will camp and stay at Sinai until Numbers chapter 10. This is the place where God has been leading his people for a long, long time. What happens here at Sinai is just as important to these people as what happened at the Red Sea. One writer says this, Sinai has been the place to which God has been leading all along, and not just in the escaped from Egypt. The whole journey from creation forward has been leading to this place. It is at Sinai that God shows the Israelites the harmonious world in which they were meant to live and calls them to live it. It's as if God is saying, this is what you were made for. You were not made to wander, to be afraid, to hunger and thirst or to be lost. You were made to live in this community of justice in right relationship with your God. Stay true to these commandments, and this is where you will remain. For, of course, it is here at Sinai that the people receive those famous commandments at number 10. With their thou shall and thou shall not, it's tempting to dismiss them as archaic rules. We ask ourselves as people who know and love Jesus, do these even hold any validity for us anymore? But when we see them in their proper place, in the right setting, we discover them for what they actually are. These ten words that we sometimes associate with burdensome laws are much better described and experienced for grace and freedom, because that's what they are. The big ten are part of Israel's story. When we remove them from that story, that's when we miss the essence of freedom that the Ten Commandments represent. The people of Israel are fresh out of slavery. They were worked relentlessly and nearly to death when they lived in Egypt. And so when God frees these people from slavery, he doesn't do so so that they go into a different kind of slavery. God frees his people from slavery. But that's not all that God does. The people are not left to drift on their own through the world, trying to make their own way. Instead, they're freed for something. They're freed to be a people of God, a people who bless the world, just as God promised to Abraham so many years before. One common way that we tend to misunderstand the Ten Commandments is to think that they're things that we need to do so that God will love us 
and will be in relationship with us. But that's not the way the story goes. In fact, it is just the opposite. Listen to what, what comes directly before the Ten Commandments are given. Why We read chapter 19 as well as chapter 20 this morning. God says, speak to the house of Jacob. Tell the people of Israel, you have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to me. You see, God has already proven his love for these people. God has already proven that he heard their cries. He's already proven that he cares enough about them to do something about their suffering. God doesn't say, do these things and I will love you and I will help you. God already loved them. God already helped them. God tells them that they are already deeply loved. And all they have to do is remember that. And then we read the following. If you will listen obediently to what I say and keep my covenant, out of all people, you will be my special treasure. The whole earth is mine to choose from, but you're special, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Now, if you read the intervening chapters between where we were last week and where we were this week, you will realize that this might actually be a bit of a surprising statement. The people of Israel are not necessarily the best traveling companions. Now last week we heard them bellowing to Moses beside the sea, were there no graves in Egypt that you brought us out into the desert to die? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Now I think last week they probably had a point. But then after the miracle of being delivered by the sea, the people begin to grumble because they have no water. And God provides them water. And then they discover that in the desert, there isn't that much to eat. And so they grumble again, and they say, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us into this desert to starve the entire assembly to death. And then, again, after they're fed with the manna and the quail, they begin to grumble about water again. You see, in the time between the Israelites walk out of Egypt and come to Sinai, they become convinced that God really brought them out of slavery only to die of some new threat four different times. God rescues them at sea and they complain that they're going to die of thirst. God gives them water and they convince they're going to die from lack of food. God gives them food and they're back to worrying about water again. For all that they have seen God do for them, for all the rescue at sea is something that they never seem to get over, for all that God proves that he loves and cares for this people many, many times over, they're pretty slow to get the message. With each new problem becomes an opportunity for them to question, does God really love us? Does God really care for us? Instead of looking for God to provide for them, they believe the worst and think they're doomed. Does this sound familiar to you? Do you and I perhaps share a little of the pessimism of the people of Israel? I can only speak for myself, but sometimes I think I do. But there is good news in our scripture. And the good news is this. No matter how bad things get, no matter how many times the people question God's intentions, no matter how many times they assume the worst, no matter how many times they take the negative view, no matter how often they grumble and complain, God still says to them, if you will listen obediently to what I say and keep my covenant, out of all people, you will be my special treasure. God treasures these people. They are God's prize. Really? These people, with their complaining and their negativity and their willingness to slip back into Egypt whenever they hit a speed bump, these are the people God has God's eye on. These are the ones he displays proudly and says, these are my people. These are the ones God looks on with delight, the one God calls his own, the one he wants to call his own forever and ever. It might be hard for us to believe that about the people of Israel. Is that hard for us to believe about ourselves too? You are God's treasure. 
No matter what your flaws or your problems, no matter how many times you fail to trust God, all the times you mess up, all the times you've questioned God, none of that matters because you are beloved. God has God's eye on you. God displays you proudly as one of his own. God looks on you with delight. And the good news is that it's not just you as an individual, but he's talking about us too. God's people gathered here in Waka, Saskatchewan, we are the people God looks on with delight. We are God's treasured ones. We know this because the Apostle Peter picks this up in his letter in the New Testament and says, but you are the chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. Peter applies this to Christians, people who follow Jesus. The people of Israel are loved. God proved it by bringing them out of Egypt, not only to just a different place, but when he brought them out of Egypt, we read that God says, I carried you on eagles' wings to myself. To myself. God brings his people to his side to be his chosen and cherished special treasure. They are loved. And it is people who are already loved who are given the Ten Commandments. God's relationship with his people is assumed here. These are not things they do so that God will love them. They are already loved and they don't have to do anything to earn God's favor. We might be surprised that God loves them, but it's there plain as day. They are loved already and completely. That comes first before any commandments, before any bargains, before anything they have to do for themselves. One writer observes, we have forgotten that Israel's liberation was an act of God's grace, not a necessary response to Israel's merit. And law is how the liberated, saved people of God say thank you. Now I've heard this saying and I think that it is true. Loved people love others. People who are loved and people who are loved well give it away. They pass it on. And so when we come to the Ten Commandments, we come to them not as some sort of entrance requirement, not as something to do in order that God loves us. God loves these people already, and so they love God back. They're saved already, and so they say thank you to God. Another writer says that these are not just good pieces of advice from a powerful God, but the required response of a grateful people. And I think it's interesting that we come to this passage on this weekend, this Sunday, which we in Canada set aside for a time of giving thanks. Because that's where we find the people of Israel this week. Having been freed from slavery, having had their every need provided for by the God who loves them again and again, over and over, when they can finally breathe free for a little bit after centuries of slavery, we find them in a place where they learn how to say thank you to God, where they learn the required response of a grateful people. Now this summer, if you were with us, we actually spent three weeks with the Ten Commandments and just about every commentary I read suggested that it's quite foolish to try to preach through all ten in a single message. So I'm not going to attempt that this morning. But I want to take a few moments to outline a couple of ways that we as God's people can respond with thanks. So the first thing that we learn from these as God's people to say thank you to God is this. Remember, look back with gratitude. That's why the giving of the law begins in chapter 19 of Exodus with these words, you have seen what I did to Egypt. You yourselves have seen this. You have witnessed this. God says, remember that. And it's repeated again in chapter 20. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. One writer points this out. 
In the Jewish tradition, the Ten Words, or the Ten Commandments, are a response to grace. Now, the Jews traditionally order their commandments differently. What the Jews regard as the first commandment or word, many Christians simply dismiss as a prologue or an introduction to the commandments. But the, in Jewish tradition, the first commandment is not, have no other gods before me, but instead, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. In other words, the first word of life with God is this, remember what God has done for you. All the other commandments flow from this, even the commandments about relationships with other human beings, because they flow out of a response to God's goodness. Remember, God says, remember what you've seen. Remember what you have experienced. Remember the stories your ancestors told you. Remember, I am the Lord your God that brought you out of Egypt. Never forget that. And a little while later in our service, we're going to celebrate communion. Also very fitting on Thanksgiving Sunday, I think. And at that table, we celebrate the thing that we as Christians never got over. The gift that God tells us once and for all that we are loved beyond all measure. And the heart of this celebration, remember, do this in memory of me, says Jesus. Never forget what I did for you. Never forget how much I love you. Paul says the same thing in the book of Romans. He says, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also graciously give us all things? And a little bit later in the chapter, Paul continues, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember. Remember Jesus. Remember the God who gave Jesus as a gift for us. Remember the love that is poured out for you on the cross. Remember. I am the God who walked among you, who bled for you, who rose again, all for you. Remember, the heart of giving thanks, the heart of saying thank you, is to never forget what God did for us. And that's why we do this over and over. That's why we go to the table of the Lord regularly, and we say the same words, and we drink the cup, and we eat the bread, because we never want to forget how much God loves us. The first response of a grateful people is to remember. Loved people look back and say, thank you. And then the second is this. Loved people love back. One of the things worth remembering about the Ten Commandments, and we've said this before, but they roughly fall into two categories. Love God and love your neighbor. And ultimately, they are the same thing. When we love God, we also love the people whom God loves. And this is familiar to us because this is how Jesus himself characterized the entire law. When Jesus was asked what the most important commandment was, he replied, the most important one is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. The Apostle John says, we loved because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. We love because God loved us first. And God has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. So the other commandments follow from this. People who love God love those around them by stopping work and allowing those who work for them also to stop work. That's the Sabbath commandment. People who love God 
love God by honoring their parents. They love God by not committing murder or adultery. They love God by not stealing. They love God by not giving false testimony against their neighbor. And they love God by not coveting those things that belong to their neighbors. Loving God and loving others is the response of a grateful people to God. And it's enshrined in the table of the Ten Commandments as well in, as in Jesus' teaching and the Apostle John absorbed this message as well. When we love God, we love others because loved people love. We see this not only in the Ten Commandments and their construction, but also in Exodus 19 when God says, the whole earth is mine to choose from, but you're special, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Now, this seems to be a theme that's come up a little bit over and over in the last few weeks. When God made God's promises to Abraham, they were threefold. God promised Abraham that he would be the ancestor of a nation. And here we have it. The people gathered at the base of this mountain are the nation that God promised to Abraham. The second promise is the promise of land. And that's a promise that they're ever moving toward from this point on. Newly freed from slavery, they spend a number of years wandering in the desert, but they do reach the land God promised them. And the final promise is this. All nations of the earth will be blessed through you. God intends to bless the world by blessing Abraham. In seeking one person, God is seeking the world. And that's the final promise that's on display here. God says that his people are to be a kingdom of priests. Now in the Old Testament, and in fact afterwards as well, a priest is someone essentially who's an intermediary between heaven and earth. Priests go to God on behalf of the people, and they're the ones whom God speaks through to his people. So they're the doorway between God and God's people. But if the entire nation of Israel is to be a kingdom of priests, then where is their parish? Who are their people? Their people are the entire world. These are the people who bring God's love, who bring God's blessing, who bring God's forgiveness, who bring God's messages and God's mercy and God's character to the world. God intends to bless the entire world by blessing these people. And you will probably remember that we actually pointed out this is the exact wording that the Apostle Peter picks up in, in the New Testament, and he applies these words to God's people in Jesus Christ. So God's people in Jesus Christ are also a royal priesthood and a holy nation. And as one of the traditional beliefs of the Baptist Church, we call it the priesthood of all believers. That means that we affirm that no one needs to go before God for you. You can go to God yourself. We don't need someone to offer sacrifices or prayers or forgiveness on God's behalf because you are able to go to God. That's because we're all priests. God deals with each one of us, so we don't need someone else to stand in the middle. But that also comes with a flip side, and that means that you represent God to the world. That means that not only do you have the privilege of coming before God, it means you have the responsibility of sharing God with the world. As God's chosen people, we bring God's character, God's mercy, God's words, God's forgiveness, God's blessing, and God's love to the entire world. So loved people, look back. And this Thanksgiving, let us look back with gratitude to never forget the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And loved people love others. We are forgiven. We are treasured. We are loved. And so we share that love with the entire world. Would you pray with me as we go to the table of the Lord this morning? Lord God, we come before you today as people who are loved. And for that love, we are grateful. Eternal God, we praise you for your creation of the world in all its richness and glory, for your great work of redemption in liberating the oppressed, renewing the weary and forgiving the sinful, for your calling of men and women to share in the work of salvation in the story of Israel and also in our stories. 
And now we give you thanks for Jesus Christ, our Lord, your word of love made flesh, who shared our humanity and revealed your grace. Therefore, with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth of your glory are full. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We thank you that God lifts up the lowly, that God heals the broken. And we thank you for Jesus' death on the cross for the redemption of the world, of which the bread and the cup are a sign and symbol. We thank you for raising Jesus to life and exalting him so that we might call him Lord and follow his way. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, for the fellowship of your church, and for all the means of hope and grace and glory. Living God, fill us with your spirit, that as we share this bread and this cup, we might feed on the body and blood of Christ and be empowered for witness and service in your world. Accept our prayers and our thanksgiving in the name of Jesus Christ, the light of the world and the life of your people. Amen. Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am now sending you. He believes in you. The busy world awaits your compassion. Sometimes you will give your best and yet fail, and other times you will succeed in spite of your stumbling. So go gladly, daring to succeed or fail, to the glory of God, and then at the very end nothing shall dismay you. God believes in us. With Christ's own breath within us, we shall travel well. The help of the saving Christ, the wisdom of the living God, and the support of the loving Spirit will be with you every step of the way, now and always. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord.